Father, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving. We come into your glorious courts with praise. We come in the name above every name, Jesus, today. Oh, Father, I pray that you will touch hearts. I pray that, Lord, you will lift burdens. I pray that you will save souls. I pray that you will encourage the downtrodden and the depressed. I pray that you will lift up. Help us to remember today, Lord, we are overcomers in Jesus today. And we are not defeated. For if God is for us, then what or who can be against us? We are on the winning side and we give honor, glory, and praise to the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For he and he alone is worthy to be glorified here today. May hearts, Lord, right now, may we lay aside the cares of life and may we lift up that name above every name. May we focus on you today, Jesus. Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Oh, Lord, let us lift up your name, and may you be glorified in the house today. For it is in the blessed, glorious name we pray, Jesus, and all the church said, Amen. Amen. Sky, and I believe it's coming back like
as I prayed about today's speech, the phrase seek to glorify kept being pressed onto my heart. That's all that just kept ringing through my head. As we go into this new week, let's seek to glorify our Father. Let's seek to glorify his name, his ways, his goodness. Let's seek to actively pursue his righteousness. Let's seek to be better people than we were last week. Amen. Let's seek to grow in his word and in his ways. Let's seek to be better spouses, children, parents, friends, co-workers, acquaintances, neighbors. Let's seek to do his will. Let's seek to follow his plan. Let's seek to speak encouragement. Let's seek to speak life. Let's seek to speak joy. Let's seek to speak positivity. Let's seek to speak kindness. Let's seek to speak love. Amen. This is the week to stop using binoculars to compare ourselves to what others are doing. This is the week to stop using a telescope to look down on and judge our peers. This is a week to stop using the mirror to look at ourselves for strength. This is a week to stop using the mirror to build ourselves up. Instead, let's use the vision God has given us to follow his vision for our lives. Let's turn our eyes to the one that gives life, love, healing, and abundant blessings. Let's focus on the Father. Let's seek to serve. Let's seek to be active for the Alpha and Omega. Your church needs you. Amen. Can I get a big amen? amen. Thank you. Making sure you're awake. <laughs> we need you here. You are awake. I know you are. You're active. We need you here. We need you serving. We need you active. The world yeah. around us is hurting. Yeah. Let's seek to serve the hurting. Let's seek to point them to the Savior. It's hard to point anybody to the Savior when we're too busy looking down on them. When we turn our noses up at people, we've placed ourselves on a self-made, self-righteous pedestal. What we're failing to remember is that in God's eyes, we are all equal. There are no pedestals in his eyes. Only sinners that he seeks to save, only sinners that he loves. Allow your words to be kind. Allow your actions to speak of the Savior. Don't just think about what would Jesus do. Do what Jesus would do. Amen. None of us are perfect. We are all people in need of the Prince of Life. This week, let's seek to be an encouragement and let's seek to edify. Let's build up instead of tearing down. Let's seek to build bridges instead of burning them. Let's seek to show the reason for the joy that is, that is within us. Let's seek to show the Redeemer. Let's seek to show the power of the mighty God within us to the world. If you are saved, let's remember that there is a force that lives within us that no scheme of man or hell can stop. Right. You have the power that raised Christ from the dead residing in you. You have the power that defeated death, hell, and the grave living abundantly in your soul. Grasp who you are through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Take a hold of who you are in him. You are a child of the living God. You are a child of the King. You're a child of the Most High. Your Father moves mountains and parts seas. Your Father performs miracles, and He makes the impossible possible. Your Father owns and even created the cattle on a thousand hills. You might feel ragged, but you're never ruined. You might feel broken, but you are never beaten. You might feel tattered, but you will triumph. You might have fallen, but you are not a failure. You will be victorious over the valley. You might feel cast down, but you are never clobbered. You are never conquered, because in him you are a conqueror. You might feel downtrodden, but through him and because of him, you are never, ever defeated. You might feel dispirited, but you have a spirit within you that says keep going. You have a spirit in you that won't let you quit. You have a spirit within you that prevails. You have a spirit in you that calms seas and storms. All of heaven is cheering you on. Make the most of every moment that God gives you. This is your time to shine for the Savior. You don't have time to lay out on God. No. You don't have time to lay out a church. No. And you don't have time to lay down your cross. No. You don't have time to lay down, look down, quit, or crumble. Praise God. The only thing you need to lay down is your sin, pride, worries, and fear. The only thing you need to quit is your complaining. And the only thing that should crumble should be the walls that hinder you from stepping into your God-given purpose. 
God has so much better for you, but it will do you no good if you don't participate in the plan. Your miracles are on the way, but you have to be willing to surrender your journey to Jesus. Your breakthrough is about to happen, but you have to believe in the bright morning star. See, you got saved, but have you surrendered? And are you serving? The Savior that saved you moves in mighty ways when you surrender it all to him. The Savior that saved your soul is worthy of praise. Amen. He's worthy of your yes, love. He He's worthy of your adoration. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy to be trusted. You can always trust that he will take care of you in any situation you face. And the things that you face may seem like the size of a mountain, but in his eyes they are minuscule compared to his might. He can heal what's hurting. He can bring peace to what's in pieces. He can mend what's shattered. He can overpower the oppression of the accuser. He can make wholeness out of the crushed. You're safe when you seek the safety of the rock of ages. You are fed when you seek the bread of life. You are a new creation when you seek the creator. You are delivered when you seek the deliverer. You have eternal life when you accept the eternal God into your heart. Amen. You will be refreshed when you seek the fountain of living waters. Yes. You have a God that will guide your footsteps. You have a hope, a hiding place, a refuge, and a reason to keep going. You have a strength and a shield. You have an intercessor and a mediator. You have a physician. You have the power of God when you seek the Prince of Peace. There's refuge in the Redeemer. There's eternal rewards in the resurrection. There's rest in the refuge. There's safety in the rock, and there's sweetness in the Rose of Sharon. God, you are adopted by the Almighty. In him, you have a stronghold and a strong tower in the storm. Seek to serve him. Seek to glorify him. Seek to be a good representation of the love of the Savior. Seek his face. Seek his will. Seek his plan. Seek his blessings, and know that you serve a God of grace and love. You are favored, Amen. and you are never alone Amen. because you have a friend that sticks closer than a Amen. brother. Amen. You have a pastor that prays for you. Amen. You have a church family that loves you. Amen. All you have to do is be here and let us love, pray for, and serve you. I continue in the series in Mark chapter 2 today, 13 through 17. Friend of sinners... I'm glad that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Notre Dame Cathedral that's located in Paris is one of the most famous buildings in the world. You see the spires of Notre Dame and you immediately identify what it is. According to the records, the cathedral began between 1160 and 1163. That's quite a few years ago. It was finished about 200 years later. So the, the history of this cathedral is amazing, and the building is amazing. It served as one of the finest examples of Gothic medieval architecture. In April 2019, a section of the cathedral uh, caught on fire, and that was undermined its infrastructure, and it also caused that majestic spire to crumble. After this catastrophe, it needed to be saved, restored, and made right, not torn down. And in the time we've seen, that majestic spire has been restored, and the cathedral is now once again inhibited by visitors and people going there to see this majestic building. But also, in the book of Genesis, God had created two majestic and beautiful creatures called Adam and Eve. But they chose to sin. Rather than follow the instruction of God, they chose to follow the enticement and the allurement of Satan, which is a type of the world. And they too, like Notre Dame, they too were ruined. We too have poisoned blood in our veins. For the word of God defines who we are. It defines what we've done. But it also defines that we can have hope. 
Because of that, we are now are broken and only a shadow of what our Heavenly Father created us to be. That was not God's intention that man would fall to the plight of sin. It was not God's intention that he would have to expel Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. But in his righteousness, in his holiness, and in his justice, he had no other choice. Because of our fallen, sin-stained, and shattered lives, which we all have faced, we need to be saved, we need to be restored, and we need to be made right. I can't make you right. I can't save you. I can't restore you. But there is a God in heaven who has made a way through his blessed son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an architect today, a rebuilder, a redeemer, and his name is Jesus Christ. And I'm glad with his stripes, we are healed. With his blood, We are redeemed. This is a blood-bought church. We today are here because of the blood of Jesus. And there's no other way but the way that God has prescribed. The call of Jesus is an invitation, not an instruction, not rules, but a relationship through the Redeemer. Not a finger-pointing God, but an embracing God in the loving arms of a Father who cares for you and I today. Aren't you glad that God made a way where we had no way? Aren't you glad that He is a Redeemer that today takes us as we are, but doesn't leave us like we were? Aren't you glad He is a life-changer? And today he is the redeemer of all mankind. Amen. Amen. Here we go. We're in Mark chapter 2, 13 through 17. And he went forth again by the seaside. And all the multitude restored unto him. And he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of customs and said unto him follow me and he arose and followed him Levi who was also named Matthew was an IRS agent (laughs) he was a tax collector yeah tis a season isn't it he was not loved of men As a matter of fact, he was hated of men. And the word of God goes on to say, and it came to pass that as Jesus said it meet in his house, many publicans, not Republicans, and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners. They said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners, the outcast, the downtrodden, just common people? Why do, how does he do this? And when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that they that are whole have no need of the physician. But they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but to sinners to repentance. The songwriter wrote, There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. A friend like Jesus who knows you thoroughly today He knows every thought that would course through your mind. He knows every deed that we do. He knows everything about us. What is done in the light, what is done in the darkness. What is good and what is bad. What is uplifting and what is downtrodden. A friend like Jesus 
who knows us that thorough today, who loves us, I mean loves us completely, who receives us gladly, who says, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I'm so glad we have that Savior. We, we have also a friend. And today, one that we're glad to hear from. And one today that we are so glad to be in his presence. I'm glad Jesus never turns a deaf ear to us. Amen. I'm glad he cares genuinely. I'm glad not only does he hear, but he acts. But let me tell you something. You have never had a friend like Jesus Amen. whose affection is so strong, whose love is so genuinely real. Maybe you've had people in your life that you thought loved you, but they just simply loved you to use you and to get out of you what they wanted Amen. and then drop you like a bad habit. That's not Jesus. He loves you and there's nothing you can do to keep him from loving you today. I don't care how far you go. He's there. I don't care how deep you're in. He will lift you up. I don't care what you're facing. He is that friend that is sticks closer than a brother. Whose purpose is to clear that you can rejoice every time Jesus comes close. You know... He just doesn't come close, but he's always there. He's always there. Amen. When no one else can be with you, Jesus is always there with you and for you. This is the friend that saw you at your worst and dug you out of that hole that you were in and called you to himself and then called you daughters and sons of the Most High God. Have you ever considered, here we are in the Lenten season, that we're reflecting on the path that Jesus would walk to the cross, there to die in our stead, there to bear our sins, there to take our shame, there to take everything that was against us, and there to pour out his blood as a crimson river that we could be plunged in that cleansing blood and be cleansed by the power of Jesus' name. Oh, as he walked the Villa de Sorosa, he walked it for you and I. As he hung there, he paid my price. He took our judgment. He took God's wrath and he took the condemnation that was against us. And he said, you have been set free in my name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. See, Jesus hasn't just saved you. He wants to use you for his glory. He doesn't use you up. He refreshes you. He restores you. And even when you've messed up, he is the God that will forgive you. Amen. Amen. Jesus, the friend of sinners and the savior of the savior of our souls. Jesus did what we, what we should have done. And he took what we surely deserved. He did that so that you and I could be forgiven. And, hear me, accepted by God. Christians in the room will raise a hand and shout amen. amen. That was poor. That was, rust. that was just downright sickening. Amen. You've got more in your Jesus in you than a, than a half staff. Amen. Christians in the house of the Lord, born again, blood washed, redeemed, children of God who have the names written in the Lamb's book of life, who has that certainty they're going to heaven and they know that they have been redeemed, will raise their hands and shout, Amen. Amen. That's the church I'm talking about. 
accepted of God, taken in, made heirs and joint heirs, adopted into the family of God where we were enemies and alienated as Paul said about us, but Jesus accepted us. He accepted you forgiven. He has changed your life. And we need to live like changed people. We need to live what we declare we are. I'm a Christian. You're not Christian by your mouth. You're Christian by your living. Amen. The story from the text is chock full and filled with the gospel. See, I, I want you to drink deep into the story. I want you to absorb in your being, in your soul, in your heart, in your mind. I, I want you to grasp today what Jesus has given and declared for you and I. By the love of Jesus, you are made completely, completely, completely right with God. It's not saying Hail Marys. It's not praying certain prayers. It's not trying to do your best. Today, you are made right with God by the blood of Jesus. And if that blood has made you right, Amen. I believe you want to live right. Amen. You've got to learn to spit in the devil's face and say no. That you will not be allured to give up, to quit. That today you will be taken up to live the life that glorifies our God. Amen. So therefore the theme simply says this. Jesus is the true friend of sinners. I tell you something. Right across this congregation, those of you who are watching by this camera on Facebook... And we're glad you're with us, by the way. Aren't we glad Facebook family has joined us? Those who will watch my television, everyone is a sinner. Every one of us are wicked. Every one of us have evil in our blood. I don't like that preacher. Well, I just told you what you are. But I'm also going to tell you what you can be. Because all of that wickedness, all that evil, all that mess of your life, one prayer in Jesus' name, forgive me, Lord, of my sin and come to my heart, saves you right on the spot. And takes all that garbage of your life and cast it as far as the east is from the west. Amen. You are redeemed. You are a child of God and there's nothing the world, the flesh, and the devil can do about it. Amen. Amen. Let me give you a few points here today. One, yield to the gravity of Jesus. The gravity, gravity pulls, doesn't it? We're held on this earth by gravity, but one day, gravity will hold us no longer. One day, we're going to be taken up flight to see our Lord and be there forevermore. Jesus has power and that power draws or pulls us to him. Jesus seeks to save people. Do you understand that? That's, that's what he came to do. For Luke tells us he came to seek and to save that which is lost. So that being the case, he seeks to save people. He comes to the hurt, the oppressed, the abused, and even the discarded. The text says the people were coming to Jesus. We need to come to him today. We need today to come to Jesus. And we need to bring to Jesus. Bring to him. Bring him today your brokenness. Bring him Bring him today your burdened heart. Bring him today the bruising of life that you've experienced. And realize you've got a God, a Savior, 
who loves you today come to Jesus but you know we're living in a world that people are running from Jesus we're living in a culture today that doesn't want to hear about a savior we're living in a generation that is rejecting God but we as believers we need to come to Jesus. You cannot solve your problems in life by yourself. You can't lift your sins from you. You can't change your life. You really today cannot do anything apart from Christ. For Jesus said in the book of Luke, without me, you can do nothing. But Paul turns around and says in the book of Philippians, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. God hasn't called you to be a quitter. God hasn't called you to stay and remain in sin. God has called you out and he's called you to himself. And he will change your life. But the question is, do you want that change? Or do you just want to continue to live defeated down and out? You just want somebody to give you a little sympathy. Uh, it, those days are over. It's time you stand up, rise up, and it's time you start being the person that God's called you to be. Unfortunately, today in our churches and our settings of churches today, it seems like there are hurdles to get to Jesus. We've turned the house of God into an entertainment center. We've turned the house of God and excluded the Bible, the blood, and the word. Well, what do you have? You have nothing. Nothing but just a bunch of people to come and kick up the flesh and make you think you feel good, but you walk out just as messed up as you walked in. Not in this church. This is a soul-saving station. This is a life-changing place. This is the place that you can meet the Lord face-to-face -face and have your life changed and see Jesus lift your burden. As I prayed with that girl that day last year, she was an atheist. And I looked at her and I said, as tears started running down her face, I said, tell me, what has the atheist done for you? She said, nothing. I said, let me introduce you to someone who will change your life, change your future, and change everything about you. His name is Jesus. That girl stood beside my bed. I'd had both legs amputated. I was in pain. But I smiled at her and said, Jesus will save you if you will give your heart to him. Do you want? Yes! Yes! That girl prayed the sinner's prayer, crying through it. I mean, snot and tears were flying. And when she prayed that prayer, but I could feel the room open up. I could feel the mighty presence of God touching her. And after she said the amen, she walked to the foot of my bed. I've told you this before. She turned around, and I'm telling you right now, I've never seen such a glow and such a smile on a human being's face. She said, Pastor, before she would call Mr. Duck. Now she called me pastor. She said, I feel so different. It's all, it's all been lifted. All that turmoil and all that struggle and all that pain in my life, it's gone. I said, that's exactly what Jesus has done for you. That's what he'll do for anyone that will come to him. Let me tell you something. Jesus draws you and I to himself. Jesus never sanctions sin. Jesus removes sin. He's a sin eradicator. Jesus doesn't condone sin. Jesus crucified sin on the cross. The pure gospel of God found in the Lord Jesus Christ always takes the wrath of God seriously and removes it. You know, the need of the gospel is we were born in sin, 
We were sinners by nature. And we live under the condemnation of that sin in our life. In that process of where we are, we have no hope but God. In his mercy sent his only begotten son. Sent and brought hope where there was no hope. And that was all found at the cross. The cross today still stands. That's why I asked our guys to put up a bigger cross in front of this church. That's why we have this cross in this building to remind you of the price that was paid for your redemption that will draw you to live at the foot of the cross and serve God at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. At the cross is the hope of God, is also the healing of God and the forgiveness of God all found in the wounds and the blood of Jesus, amen. With his stripes, you are made whole. What does that mean? It means you're redeemed. What does that mean? It means you're saved. Well, pastor, I, I'm born again. I'm born. Yeah, you're born. We're all born into this world. Evidence is in our flesh. But are you reborn in the spirit of God? And that you received him. John 12, 30, or John 12, 32 says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself. Jesus died on the cross for all people. He died for the prostitute. He died for the homosexual. He died for the transgender. He died for the criminal. He died for every person. He didn't die just for the good people. He died for all people. He died for every color of our skin that we can be. He died for every sin that we commit. See, there's a lot of nice, good people that live in communities and neighborhoods, but they're lost. It's just not the incarcerated. It's just not the people who have chosen to do drugs or alcohol or live a rebellious life. We all are rebellious. We're all rebels. But God takes a rebel and redeems that person. Amen. Amen. Are you just playing a, the role of a Christian? Because Jesus is calling every one of you and I today to live for him. Your greatest need is Jesus. And you can't let anything get in the way of Jesus in your life. We must hold up that name above every name. We need real and vibrant worship, not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. And it all is appointed to our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he is deserving of our praise today, Amen. of our worship. Amen. Would you stand up and give him some praise? Come on. That's who we're here for. That's what we're all about. He is the one. He is the one that's worthy to be praised today. Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty. Amen. You may be seated. Second, we need to rejoice in the grace of Jesus. Grace is a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith. The man in verse 14 is a man whose name is Levi, who is, as I told you, Matthew, who was a tax collector. Levi is Jewish, but serving Rome. So there's a problem right there. He didn't know God. See, just being Jewish didn't make him know God. Being, well, my family lineage is all Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. None of that stuff will get you heaven. Being a Baptist doesn't get you to heaven. Being a Christian gets you to heaven. Amen. So he didn't know God. His religion was of the world. And that's what religion is. It's of the world's way to God. And then Jesus said to Levi, follow me. Follow me. 
He was the most unlikely to follow God. He was the most hated in the community. He was the most unliked. He probably, in the yearbook, he would be voted as the guy most unlikely to do anything with his life. But how about you and I today? Is that what they said about you and I? Did you grow up being pressed down? Did you grow up maybe a family that was not very good? Maybe you grew up on the street. Maybe you grew up not knowing. Maybe you grew up influenced and taken the way of the world. Maybe you grew up as a nice person in a nice neighborhood going to a nice little church every Sunday. It matters not what your past was. It matters what you have done with Jesus because he can take every bit of your past and forgive it and redeem you and you are a new person in him. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You've got a new life. Do you? But the word or the question is, do you? Maybe they said you'd never mount anything. You would never uh, really do anything with your life. And maybe in your past you didn't. But God's giving you a new life. You don't have to settle for what someone else said. You can settle for what God has said over you. Amen. That in all things, you are more than a conqueror. That you are a, listen to the way John put it in Revelation. You are kings and priests of the Most High God. You're not defeated. You're not today down and out. Praise God, you have been lifted up and lift it out and you become now a valuable member of the family of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Understand three things today that's crucially important. There's power in the gospel. Gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It is a sovereign call. For sovereign meaning it's an all-powerful call. And it is a powerful call when Jesus calls you because he calls you to a better life, a richer life, an abundant life. Jesus said, the thief has come to kill, steal, and to destroy, but I have come that you can have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. But Levi had a big hole in his heart as we all have had, but Levi made it a decisive move he followed Jesus. Did he just get up and follow Jesus? No. I believe in that following of Christ. He was purged of his sin and he became a child of God. And then he did immediately what we need to do. Take up our cross and follow Jesus. Amen. So you're saved. Praise God. But what are you doing with it? What are you doing with what God has done in your life? I don't believe you can be quiet silent or seated over what Christ has done in your life. I believe that if he's changed you, you can't settle for the nominal life. You can only settle for the life that glorifies him. He must put our backs and we must put our backs and he will help you to put your back to the world and put your face to Christ. To follow Jesus to be who you should be by his grace. This is what happens in salvation. We lay down the world and we take up Christ. There is a monumental change in your life. Second, there's mercy in conversion. God only saves people who doesn't deserve Jesus. And that includes everyone. We don't deserve him. We don't deserve his mercy nor his grace. But he opens his arms and says, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. That's Jesus. That's what he'll do. God doesn't see us in our potential. God sees us today 
not in our pitiful condition. We don't go after people in the church because they got good potential. We go after people for Jesus. And realizing because of mercy, we have received the forgiveness of God instead of the condemnation that we were deserving of. So I'm glad that God doesn't see, oh, I'm going to save that person because they know a lot. They've been to good schools. They've got good jobs. And they've got, no, he serves the lowest and brings them up to the highest. Amen. And then third, obedience is the proof. Let today, Levi got up. He got up from his former life and he followed Jesus. Let me tell you something right now, church. Many times we give so much credit to where we used to be and what we used to be, but we never give credit to who we are in Christ. We're so busy talking about the rear view mirror. You need to take it down. Stop living in what you were and start living in who you are. Start following Christ. It doesn't matter how much you took or what you did or whatever, whatever or however happened in your life. That's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. God's bringing you to heaven because of the change that has happened in your life and who you are now in Christ. Now take that life and use it for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. There's a new life in Jesus. Levi's response was immediate and the, and the results was transformative. He was transforming. Here is a picture of the remarkable Jesus of what he will do in a life. Sin disfigures you, but the grace of God, it remakes, reforms, and regenerates your life. Jesus took the justice we deserve and he gave us his grace. Third, imitate the graciousness of Jesus. I'm almost through. And the church said, preach on preacher. Thank you. <laughs> grace is what we get at the cross, isn't it? I'm giving you some very fundamental issues today. We sometimes need to go back to the grassroots of our belief system. And grace is what we then not only have received, grace then is what we give. Levi invited people to his house for the meal? No. To meet Jesus. To have in their life what had happened to him. All his friends were sinners. <laughs> you can invite your friends to church to meet Jesus. And I'll be more than glad to tell them about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. There's joy in bringing your friends to Christ. I had the privilege many years ago of bringing a dear friend of mine to Christ when we lived in San Antonio. That friend today is now a preacher. That friend today is going to Guatemala and other South American countries and building schools and churches and ordaining preachers to do a work for Christ. You know, in verse 15, Jesus called a physician. He is called a physician. A physician goes where the sick are, doesn't he? The doctors desire to relieve pain and to cure sickness. Jesus is the friend of sinners. And he came to save sinners. See, the physician, better yet, the great physician is in the house right now. Amen. Lost people are not our enemy. They are our mission. Sign over the door. You are now entering the mission field when you walk out of this church. What's the mission field? The mission field is lost sinners to come to Christ. Don't get caught up in the culture war and lose sight of the mission of Jesus for each of us. And lastly, join the goal of Jesus. The Pharisees, the scribes, had two problems with Jesus. One, that he claimed to forgive sins. They said only God can forgive sins. Secondly, he, his attitude towards sinners. They shun they placed themselves 
in a better position in their culture, their life. They were lifted up. The sinner was pressed down. Why did Jesus sit and eat with reprobates and sinners, the lost? Jesus can't meet a need that you won't admit. And I'm going to tell you, you're never going to get saved. You're never going to come to Christ until you admit you need Jesus. You will never come to Jesus until you admit who you are. He can only save you, not by religion, but by redemption to take you to a relationship. You've got to come to the end of who you are. It's not how nice you look or where you live or what you drive or where you work or who you are. It's the fact today that you and I are lost sinners in need of a Savior. And Jesus, thank God, he will take us as we are, but change us to be who he wants us to be. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. And the question is, have you answered that call? You can't get saved until you see yourself lost. I'm looking across this congregation and I'm making eye contact with you. Are you? Lost today. Jim Hendrickson sat in that seat last Sunday and walked out and said, See you next Sunday, Ducky. Monday, Jim graduated into the presence of God. He went, left the home that morning, left Connie went to the wider walk, one lap around, he passed out and he died. Well, preacher, don't I have plenty of time? No. The only time you've got is right now. God didn't place you here today by accident, but by appointment. The cross was not an accident. It was an appointment of Jesus that we could receive the forgiveness of God later pastor I, I, you know I, I'm not ready if you're not ready now when will you be ready now is accepted time behold today is the day of salvation so as I close you need to realize you're lost and that you're a sinner The religionists never make it to heaven. You can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. You must see your own sin and take ownership of it. Drew shared with me some months ago, we were driving in the car. We were talking about conditions, life, different things. He said the problem is people won't take ownership of their sin. We want to blame it on everybody else and everything else. No, 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 no. Everything else and anything else did not put you where you are. You chose to do what you did. But Jesus can forgive you of it. You have to see the depth of your sin for it is dragging you right down to the abyss. The abyss is hell and if you don't get saved, you're going there. Point blank. Today is the day that we cry out to Jesus. Today is the day that you can get saved. Today is the day you, even if you're saved, you don't need to get saved again, but maybe there are sins in your life. You need to cleanse your heart. You need to be right with God every day, every minute of the day. You need to confess your sins. Because somebody comes to an altar doesn't mean, oh, I wonder what they've done. No, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter what they've done. And maybe they didn't come for something they've done. Maybe they came to pray for you. Amen. Or maybe they came just to say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Never judge what's happening at the altar. Get to the altar and get your life right with the righteous judge, who is Jesus Christ. If you're lost, you can come to him today. If you've got sin in your life, you can come and have it forgiven. 
If you've got burdens in your life, and we all do, you can find relief in Christ today. The call is when? Now. And the question is, will you come? Come to Jesus today.